if most of your work, most of your visual environment is close, then the image, the light rays from that close object are diverging. And so they are falling behind the retina of someone who's perfectly targeted for distance. So your eyeball is really smart and it says, okay, so you're telling me everything is here close up. I know I'll just grow longer so that these near objects are in perfect focus. And that is exactly what happens. Over so, what time scale? Over a period of months. So if you take a young person and you exclusively have them perform near tasks, their eye will grow longer so that those near objects are in perfect focus. So if you could do an awful experiment, it's been you done. would take a child and not sh put them in a white room where there's nothing that they can see that's far away and just have them play with close objects that they can reach. Yeah. And you would put that kid into glasses as a child. That's called society in 2021 is children looking at screens near objects for hours on end and not going outside. There are two drivers of nearsightedness in the plastic developing human. Number one, uh, deprivation from outdoor light. And number two, near work. So for example, there have been cohorts of children. These, most of these studies have been done in Asia where there is an epidemic right now of myopia of astonishing proportions. I'm talking about 90% of the population is now nearsighted in certain Southeastern Asian cities. Um, when that becomes such a dominant phenotype, something is really oddly off. So, wow. so this really transcends evolution because trans you can change, if you can change something in years or in, months. Within the, it's not evolutionary. It's, yeah, it's, it's within not. the eye. It's, it's adaptive within yeah. the eyeball itself. So if you take a group of children, and this has been done, seven to 11 year old children, and you send half of them outside for 80 minutes during the school day for recess, and half of them stay inside in an indoor environment for their recess, the risk of, or the incidence of nearsightedness is 50% higher, higher, or it's half in the group that went outside. Mm. So you cut your risk in half by going outside. Now we think that without any instruction to go and look at things far away, but just by the very fact that if you're outside, there's so much more to see and you're going to be looking further out. Right. And it, and this has been further studied in terms of, is it just being outside or is it the light? Yeah, It's actually both, but the light is really the most important driver of protection from nearsightedness. So if you are outside on a bright sunny day, you're releasing a fair bit of dopamine from your retina and dopamine inhibits the growth of the eye. So the worst thing you could do is stay inside in a dimly lit room and perform near tasks. That raises your risk of nearsightedness 16 fold compared to kids who go outside. I'm sure there's epidemiology that would suggest that the further you are from the equator, does that imply that you have a greater risk of nearsightedness just based on the light part of this argument? Yes, there is some data to look at that. Uh, that, that shows that. And not only that, they've taken children and given them equal intervals of outdoor activity, but the ones who had noontime outdoor activity did, did better, better than the ones who were outdoors at 8 a.m. where there was less illumination. And we know from animal models that it is illumination that is critical in this dopamine release. So you know, does that mean we need more skylights in classrooms or more windows? We, we need more natural light. Could we artificially mimic some of the sunlight by making these rooms brighter and, pre and prevent some of this myopia epidemic? Is a photon a photon a photon? I mean, does it, I mean, I, I don't think that it's known, frankly, Peter, whether that's the case, because there are different, there's a whole spectrum of light. So is the blue light more important? 
this is tangential and we'll talk about this, I know, but blue light, you hear all this negativity about blue light. Blue light is critical for wakefulness, mm -hmm. for attention, for, I think, for preventing myopia. And by the way, when we say myopia, nearsightedness, it's not just the inconvenience of wearing glasses or contact lenses or having laser vision correction when you're 23 years old. There are pathologies that are much more common in very nearsighted patients compared to the general population. It's much more common to see cataract formation in myopic patients. They get something called myopic macular degeneration. They're at risk for glaucoma. They're at risk for tears and detachments of the retina. So it's not just the inconvenience of spectacles. These are disease associated conditions. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.